Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, third analog devices with electronic webinar. Uh, I welcome everyone uh, from the Benelux, but also from some other countries. So we have this uh, today in English language. Um, hopefully that's okay for everyone. If not, then uh, please contact us and we'll be happy to do it again and then in Dutch. Um, Today we have two speakers. Uh, first of all, we have from Analog Devices, Ernest Bron. He will start off uh, this meeting. He's field application engineer and situated in the Netherlands. And our second speaker is Raf Fleukels, also a field application engineer, in this case from Brute Electronic, and he's situated in Belgium. Um, but he's also uh, allowed to work in the Netherlands, of course. Uh, and he's here. Uh, today I'm your host. My name is Alex Schneider, uh, also a field application engineer, uh, but that's beside the point for this webinar. Um, let's see if we can get the next slide. This webinar is uh, uh, set up like that you are muted, so you cannot talk to us, but you do have the option to ask some questions. Um, we have a Q&A option in the webinar system where you can uh, write down all your questions during the webinar and after the webinar itself, we will uh, we will try to answer all of your questions, of course. Um, if we're not able to answer it uh, because of time or because your question is too complex, then of course we'll come back to you later uh, via email or by a telephone call. Um, the total webinar will take about two times 30 minutes, so we have an hour in total. Uh, and for today, we have uh, the agenda uh, where uh, Ernest Brond will talk about driving LEDs from the IC point of view, looking at, at the requirements and mainly at the bug boost topologies uh, in, on that point. Uh, from with electronic, we will talk about the LED and then more specific to the high power LED and we focus a little bit on the infrared uh, LED. Uh, and also we look at term considerations and of course we take a look at some EMI things to watch for. Uh, and just a heads up for uh, our next session, which is in two weeks time, then we have a similar webinar session like this one. And then we talk about isolated power. Um, it's uh, scheduled for February 11th, same time, same place. And you can uh, yeah, write down the shortcut if you want to, or uh, I will drop it later on in the uh, in the chat box as well for you to copy it from that point. So that is from my point, uh, the introduction. Um, again, if you have any questions, please do ask them. We always like to receive them. Um, and for now, I will start to giving the pointer to Ernest Brun so that he can start his presentation. Okay, thank you, Alex. You can see my screen now? Very clear. Good okay. luck. All right, thank you. So, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to uh, to listen to uh, to me. <laughs> Driving LEDs. So, today I have uh, 30 minutes and I have to be honest, I practiced this a little bit in terms of to check how much time I have and I need to speak fast in order to meet the 30 minutes. Does that mean you can ask, you cannot ask questions, please do. Um, I think we have a session at the end. So today I'll talk a little bit about a very brief introduction to driving LEDs, very, very brief. Then quite some time about features and requirements, explaining features as we we, uh, we saw them in the past and give you a flavor of some of the new features that we are adding and planning to add to uh, some of our new products. And at the end, the, the, the second uh, part of my session will be uh, about buck boost LED drivers, why you would want to use those and um, uh, what they can uh, provide to you. And then also how you potentially want to use matrix uh, power uh, architectures, matrix LED driving uh, architectures. Okay, so um, my first slide is perhaps a little bit weird, but uh, driving LEDs looks like driving cars if you look at it from the right perspective. So in the old days, you had a car, you just, you know, you went you went from A to B, that was it, really not much more. And then as you progress over time, this is probably in the 50s, last century. So you're still driving, right? The, the main purpose is still driving to get from A to B, but you have all kinds of other stuff uh, going along with it, uh, uh, specifically comfort, uh, you can drive higher higher speed, etc. And then today, if you look at all the features you get in a modern car, this is not my car, 
don't have that kind of money. But if you have a car like this, you look at all the features, then really, you know, getting from A to B is just almost a side effect of everything else that they're doing in terms of uh, safety, comfort, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. Driving LEDs is not 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 dissimilar if you think about it, because uh, in the old days, people just looking to drive an LED, but today you have an LED driver that can drive LEDs, but then also needs to do it safely, securely, low EMI, uh, guaranteed, uh, easy to uh, to use, etc. All kinds of additional features that come along with an LED driver. So, um, looking at a very simple way of uh, of driving an LED. So this is just um, um, uh, on the right side. You see the LEDs, right? So bunch of LEDs in series and you need to drive them in this particular case here 500 milliamps. Now in order to do that you need your LED driver which is shown here right. The first thing you would want to um, uh, look at when you consider selecting an LED driver is um, the output voltage and the input voltage right. So the output voltage mainly is, um, is, is determined by the amount of LEDs in series that you have. Uh, each LED has a VF so X times VF equals the maximum amount of uh, output voltage you will have. There's a slight variation over the current, but you know, roughly X times VF would be uh, would be output voltage. And then based on that, you have an input voltage rail, the one you have available, right? If it's higher, then you need to uh, step down. If it's lower, then you need to step up. And if it can be lower or higher, then you need to have a buck boost type of uh, converter. So V in, V out really uh, deals with what I'm marking in green, the topology. That's a, a key thing in, in terms of selecting an LED driver. After that, once you have something that uh, that might work for you in terms of stepping up, step down, the thing with LEDs is you want to control brightness, right? So you have 500 milliamps here that gives you a certain amount of LED or, uh, light that comes out of the LEDs, but you don't want to have them turned on all the time, right? You maybe also want to turn them off or you want to have uh, half of the brightness or a quarter or, or, or even, even less or you want to have some variation, right? So you want to have brightness control. So that's something that even the most basic LED drivers would have uh, in terms of a feature, um, and 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 in this particular case, you can you can there is a control pin here, but okay, this is just an example. Dimming you can do it two ways, right? The easiest way or the the most um, obvious way is, is is if you use DC uh, dimming, or we call, we call it also analog dimming. That's when you say, okay, I don't want 500 milliamps, I want maybe 100 milliamps or maybe 150. Uh, or maybe 200, right? So you just control the current. That's wonderful, and that's fine. The downside is that, that though, that if you uh, if you uh, look at the uh, the physics of the LED, if you change the current, you change the light spectrum that comes out of it uh, slightly, ever so slightly, depending, I guess, on the LED type, etc. So if you want to do something uh, where you need to have relatively accurate color control, you really don't want to change the current. In that case, if you want to adjust brightness but do not want to touch anything related to color you can do pwm pwm means instead of changing the current you keep the current at the maximum but you just turn the led off and on for your for a certain duty cycle so let's say 50 percent and then you have an averaging of 50 percent of the current and you see you have half the uh, brightness you need to do this fast enough that your eyes doesn't see it but okay um, and the downside of PWM is, of course, that you have some some something switching again, and switching is always bad for EMI. So then, moving on to the next feature that you would have uh, is uh, on LED driving is uh, protection. So protection uh, basically means um, all kinds of features that are implemented that deal with um, um, open sh shorts. Uh, things like that, right? Some of it you, you standard also have on, on DC DC converters, but on LED drivers, you potentially also want to have additional features with uh, which which are more likely uh, to happen with uh, with LED drive. Um, so uh, in this particular case here, for instance, you have a current sense that also deals with, with, with the loop control, but you can also use it to, to detect, uh, to detect failures if you want. And then uh, one of the uh, last more common features are things that deal with EMI. So if you have uh, a LED driver that is based on switching technology, it's turning on and off switching. So you have switching noise EMI and you want to have the ability to control it. So you, you end up with things like uh, the ability to switch the uh, or change the or adapt the uh, switching frequency or potentially synchronize the switching frequency to some external clock so that although you know that it is switching at least you know at what frequency exactly so you 
you have an idea where to start filtering to get rid of the uh, of, of all this noise, and then potentially you can also do things like uh, spread spectrum uh, and stuff like that. One thing I didn't mention is, of course, the control loop for any LED driver that that needs to provide a current. The control loop needs to be able to actually operate on that, right? You need to be able to uh, to to control current and not voltage. Most of the uh, most of the uh, the DC DC converters you can you can adapt to do this, but an, an LED driver would have uh, would be optimized to actually uh, have current uh, control. Now, moving forward and looking at an example of uh, actual devices, um, I start now with a, and as, as an example, the, the, the 3755, it's a relatively old uh, controller, but if you look at the data sheets, you see a bunch of features that come on page one. So how do they relate, relate to the different uh, um, areas of, 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 of features that I mentioned, right? So first of all, topology. In this particular case, the device can do bug, bug boost, SEPIC. So that relates, of course, to the topology. Likewise, uh, it features high side current sensing that relates mainly to topology because it, it gives you an indication of what kind of um, uh, topologies you can do. Current sensing, of course, also relates to actual uh, the, the regulation, etc. Okay. Uh, protection, so it features open LED protection, brightness control, the PWM dimming or the analog dimming capability, and then some features related to uh, to EMI. Right, so adjustable frequency and uh, synchronization in this particular case. So then as we move on into uh, in time, <coughs> apologies, um, there were a bunch of follow-up devices and they started implementing newer features. Um, so one of the features, for instance, that, that you have uh, on, on many of the recent uh, release devices is something called internal PWM, where you're still dimming through a PWM signal, but now that signal is being generated internally. So you do not need to provide something from external that toggles up and down. You just set some, some, some value mostly with a, with a resistor uh, that gives you a certain duty cycle at a certain frequency, and that is being used to actually dim the whole thing. Obvious benefit is you don't need to provide that signal. You may not have it. You may not have uh, enough lines through your cable going to the LED driver, or you may not want to have something toggling here in terms of uh, noise and all kinds of crap coming out of it. Um, the other thing that you start seeing, and this in this particular case, is, is, is low side LED sensing. Um, actually, it's shown here still high side, but Basically, the current sense is optimized that you can either put it here or here. So really what it says is, is, is a flexibility in terms of where to put the current sensing. If you can make it as flexible, you can either put a high side, low side, or even potentially here, then you can be much more flexible in terms of the topology that you need to use, uh, that, you, that you can apply in order to, uh, for this particular LED driver. Um, some other features that came along later, the spread spectrum, I already mentioned it. Um, high side PWM disconnect sounds a bit trivial, trivial, right? So you put the, uh, the FET here instead of uh, on the low side, but it has a nice side effect um, that you now can attach the LED string just, just here. So if you assume, let's say this is a, a car, you, you, you hook up your LED string on the low side to chassis, which is your ground loop and you just hook the LED string on one side. So now you just have one cable or one line going through some remote, potentially remote LED string, as opposed to here where you have two wires that go to the LED driver. So it's just two wires and it's, it's a bit more tricky to hook it up. Um, additional features with protection, current limiting on the input. And then moving to some of the really recent type of innovations that you have seen either on some very recent LED drivers or some parts that are about to be released. So some of these uh, you will not be able to see on existing devices yet. Things like exponential scale internal PWM generator. So again, internal PWM, but now it is using an exponential scale, which effectively makes the LED intensity linear. So basically just it adapts it to your eye. Uh, Two-pin multiplying analog dimming. So in many cases, we already offer uh, two two control pins that do analog dimming. Right, so you can use one pin to 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 set the current and another pin to to set the current again, but using some other input, potentially things like uh, temperature or ambient light that you measure somewhere else, or the temperature of the LED. And then based on the temperature of the LED, 
you scale back the current as part of the you know the control loop so you don't need to have some kind of feedback into a microcontroller that then decides what to do um, but this two pin multiplying analog dimming uh, feature that, that we will have on, on some of our newer devices will allow a much more complex function to implement it to be implemented so you have more control on, on how you want to uh, shape uh, your, 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 your analog dimming current control um, then something a bit vague improved control and current limits but this is something that that you will see effectively uh, as improvements on every later next generation led driver because it's like of the holy grail in, in led driving uh, you want to ensure stable switching over all duty cycles this really relates to the fact that if you if you think of an led driver sure it's a dc dc most of the time right uh, like a DC DC converter for for voltage regulation, but the voltage regulation DC DC okay, so it has some load steps, etc. But and and there is going to be some variation on how 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 it can load step, and you need to make sure it's okay, etc. But with LED drivers, um, this dimming uh, very often generates a much much more severe type of um, load step, if you will. Um, so so it it is extremely difficult to make sure. That, that the uh, the LED driver you have is stable under any possible and potential type of uh, condition. So there's a lot of effort always going into making sure that the control loop is always stable. Uh, sure, you'll have some overshoot, sure you'll have some undershoot, etc. But you want to make sure you 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 go back to normal as soon as possible. All of this to ensure there's going to be no LED flickering under any condition. So first of all, you don't want to have it visible. But there's also tons and tons of applications that rely on extremely accurate short pulses for all kinds of uh, funky medical type of applications so you, you really can't have any 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 weirdo effects happening there so no led flickering and improved led current accuracy which deals with the fact that uh, you have an led that can do a certain amount of current it has an upper limit of uh, of the maximum pulse it can handle so if you do some 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 kind of uh, dimming or on off or whatever You'll, you, you might see some over and undershoot. You want to make sure that under all cases that undershoot and overshoot is extremely well controlled. Um, then, of course, improved short circuit protection. Protection is continuously being improved on, on every uh, new device with ways to, uh, to implement uh, better and cleaner protection. In this particular case, um, for a new device, we've implemented a, an improved short circuit protection that is extremely fast. Again, making sure that if something bad happens, anything external is stressed, but not too long, not longer than absolutely needed. Low EMI, of course, things like uh, spread spectrum, etc. I already mentioned, but on our new devices, we're also going to include things like silent switching, which I think we discussed in earlier sessions. Um, so here we're talking about silent switching generation two, which will effectively uh, put the, uh, the loop capacitors inside uh, making sure that the uh, the loop is as small as possible internally and uh, the cancellation is optimized, effectively giving you what, easily 20 dB uh, noise improvement. Okay, so so much about uh, features. Um, and I see I need to speed up. So buck boost LED drivers, why would you want to use them? So first of all, we have tons of LED drivers, buck boost, all kinds of stuff. Just want to highlight now the buck boost LED drivers because of some nice... Uh, features they have. So first of all, why would you want to use a, a buck boost LED driver? Obviously, because you want to step up or step down. You don't know, right? So you have a bunch of LEDs. They need certain voltage, and your input voltage can be higher or lower. What can you do? You can either go and boost first and then buck, or you just use a buck boost uh, converter or SEPIC, whatever. Okay, but in this particular case, we're talking about buck boost for switches. So we have a family of devices, and some of the features are highlighted here in Dr. Current Sense in the middle. I will explain that a little bit later, why that is so wonderful. Uh, bootstrap diodes are integrated, basically gives you uh, less, less components, fine. But, uh, you know, the other features that I already discussed, analog dimming, two pins, internal external PWM dimming, spread spectrum, uh, accurate uh, feedback uh, regulation, uh, and very accurate current regulation and also using just a 100 millivolt drop, so quite quite efficient. And the high side PWM switch, as I mentioned, as a, as a, as a benefit. So these buck boost controllers contain, going leaving all the animation away, 
uh, they contain uh, the sense in the middle and it has a, a, a specific benefit in terms of EMI. If you look at some of the older architectures of, uh, and in fact, the architecture of, of most of the bug boost converters on the market, you see your four switches that can do your buck and your boost. You have your inductor in the middle and then you have your SINs here. So what that does then mean in terms of, 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 of the, uh, the hot loop, the essential loop that we, uh, that we always use for, for indicating EMI, is you have two loops, one on the input, one on the output. Um, and they are big, right? So you can optimize your layout to make them as small as possible. Make them as small as possible because smaller is less noise. That's uh, always the thing, right? With this new uh, topology, uh, we effectively split the input and the output loop into two smaller ones, if you do the layout right, right? Okay, if you do it like this, it's very small. So smaller loop, less EMI. We have two of them, but the other one is opposed. So it starts canceling. So we have less EMI, and a big chunk of that is already canceled as well. So all in all, this will give you low EMI, specifically designed for low EMI and then for LED drivers. In a picture, you can see this. There's two graphs here. You can see we easily meet some, some CISPA class here on an EVO board. This is the 8391. It's a, a, it's a two megahertz version. The red one uses a series resistor to the gate drive. So effectively you slow, slow down the gate, you slow down the FET turning on and the turning off. So uh, the edges are less steep, so you have less EMI. It costs you efficiency, of course, but uh, well, it, if, 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 you know, if you want to avoid having to do a redesign, then, uh, then you uh, might opt to, uh, to just increase a small resistance somewhere and, uh, and, and get away with it. Okay, now a lot of things you want to watch out for when you do LED drivers. But one thing when you do a bug boost, I want to highlight that um, you do all your standard testing. And in this particular case, I show, for instance, analog dimming. Uh, and let's say V in is smaller than V out. Wonderful, you boost and you dim. So you have your control voltage high, your control voltage low, and your LED current high, LED low, current low. Looks wonderful, right? No big deal. Everything fine. In the bug case, the same thing. High, low, looks great. But what you want to also check is when Vn equals V out almost, and then in the range going up and going down. For any buck boost type of design, not just for LED drivers, you want to you want to make sure you 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 thoroughly test test that region because that's where it it decides to go from buck to boost, and that's where some some kind of funky effects can happen. With our device, as you can see, there's no issue, but uh, and this is just for analog dimming. But anything related to actually the whole application, not just pure LED driving. For bug boost, you always want to check out this region and make sure it's 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 okay. Uh, matrix power LED driving. Just to explain what I mean with matrix or what we mean with matrix LED driving, this is something that is heavily used in automotive, um, <clears throat> but it's also uh, used in other types of applications. But because it's heavily used in automotive, uh, you see a lot of parts focusing very much on that, and a lot of collateral goes uh, you know goes that way and I don't have time to go and fix all these slides and put other pictures in it. So pardon, if you don't do automotive, the principle is the same. So matrix, really what, you, what, you, what you're doing is you, ha you, you have a bunch of high current LEDs. You can also do it with low current, but high current because of, because of the difficulty. Uh, you wanna all drive them with the same current. And then, you know, by definition, it's very simple to put them in one string because then they all see the same current but you want to turn them on and off individually or in a cluster or something like that. In this particular case for a uh, LED driver uh, module, right, you have your high beam, your low beam, and uh, what is this CLL? I don't know. Um, uh, and basically you want to turn this on or off and the way you can do it, uh, you, you just short them, right? So you have a switch here. So normally you have seven LEDs and then you short four and you just have three. But the current, the current just go to the FET. So the current remains the same. So these FETs will see basically the same current whether or not you short this or not. Right? So it's a wonderful idea. The only, or well, not only, but anyway, the main downside or the issue with this is when you do this, you're effectively, let's assume three volt per LED. You effectively go from 21 volts and then you short four of them, for instance, you go to nine volts. So the voltage here goes up and down like crazy. And the LED driver that provides a constant current needs to be okay with that. Not, not every LED driver can do this, right? So you need to be okay with that. And then of course, this, this, this bypassing, you can do it in many ways. You can do it discreetly. You can do it with dedicated ICs. Uh, it needs to happen in a, in, 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 a, in a good enough way. And you need to check for all conditions that you wanna, that you wanna uh, generate to make sure that you're not uh, violating some, some specifications. 
Now, the other module that, or the other main applications where you see this application is something called the sequential turn light, is what you see on those, those, those fancy cars when, when they turn right or left, uh, they just don't blink, they, they, they have this night Rider effect type of thing. Same principle, a bunch of switches that turn on and off to create patterns. So you can do this discreetly. I'm going very fast, I'm sorry, but uh, um, limited time. So we can do this discreetly, right? So we don't sell discrete, but we do test a lot on this because um, we want to make sure that uh, what our customers do, that our LED drivers can handle it, right? So the way you can do this discreetly is you have a bunch of FETs, you turn just turn them on and off and you bypass them. And here on the high side for these, these huge amount of FETs, you see a little bit more complex structure to do this in a clean way. I'll explain a little bit later. But the point of, of all of this testing is really for us to make sure that the LED driver can do this. If you implement this, you start seeing waveforms like this, V out, you know, going up in steps as you as you turn on and off these uh, these these uh, these fets, and then you see you know your light LED current uh, here is completely off, and then you see some LED current, you see some spikes. So this looks fine, and if you then zoom it out for all of the patterns that you want to be able to implement, you start seeing these these regions where you need to watch out, right? And these ones you need to then check and make sure that your circuit. Is not going to violate uh, certain peak level uh, numbers for for your LED, or it's going to be stable and not oscillate like crazy and stuff like that. This circuitry I mentioned looks a little bit more complex. So you have basically your your, your bypass uh, fed here, and what was done here is just slowing down the edges in order to uh, to ensure that the uh, the over and under shoot is not that bad. So effectively, this is a, a current mirror. You set your current here. This is so a relatively low current used to drive the FET. And then the miller capacitance is just uh, enlarged uh, quite a bit to make sure it's, 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 it's rather slow. So the cap is rather slowly charged by a relatively low current. And that's the way you can, you can make it work for, you know, bypassing large amounts of FETs. And then you want to check it in detail, right? So this is good versus bad. You can imagine which one is good. That's one of ours. This would be somebody else. And then you measure, you know, the maximum current uh, or the maximum peaks that you see. And then for 1.5 amp, this will be okay. And you want to do this over temperature, etc., as well. So again, good versus bad. If you go from two, two to 10, you see the opposite effect. And if it's not really well, then you start seeing these kind of effects and a whole bunch of oscillation. And then the other option that you have is you use matrix LED dimmer ICs, which we also provide. Principle is the same. You have a bunch of uh, drive, uh, LED drivers. So in this particular case, first a boost and then a buck, and then the matrix. Uh, I see the matrix is just the, the, the switches inside, but then the whole control structure is optimized for ultra fast switching, low EMI and well controlled. And then the ability to easily generate patterns using some, some digital light square C bus. The thing you see here is the, the the actual constant current is being generated by a buck without a cap. And a buck without a cap is ideal for this because it, the buck really is forgiving for all this, this crap that the uh, bypassing does. And you don't, and it also uh, allows no cap and you don't want to have a cap because as I said, you know, as you start bypassing, the voltage goes up and down like crazy and a cap will resist uh, fast uh, voltage transient. So you really don't want to have a cap. Right. But the question now is, can we use a buck boost? Because who wants to use a boost and then a buck, right? If you if you want to save money or something, you want to use a buck boost. So long story short, yes, you can, but you need to uh, you know double check. First of all, we do have capacitors on the output. There's not much you can do about that. The part really needs it. They are relatively small. And then what you can see, it works. Uh, but in boost, inherently, you have a higher ripple. So the LED will see this ripple. This is relatively fast. You won't see it with your eyes, uh, but the LED will see it. And uh, for the buck, the ripple is much, much lower. Um, and uh, also it will work uh, well. So within limits, it will work. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. If you have questions, there's a session at the end, or you can just drop me an email. Thank you very much. And well, see you next time. Well, thank you very much, Ernest. It was actually quicker than that you would uh, need. Uh, you, had, you had a bit more time available, uh, but not to worry. Um, just a small reminder, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A uh, box. We are happy to answer them after the session. Uh, for now, I will...
transfer the presenter mode to Ralph so he can start his presentation. Just a second. Okay, uh, uh, Alex, you can see the presentation? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thanks a lot. Good luck. Thank you. So, um, I would also like to welcome all of you to, uh, to our webinar, um, High Power LED Applications and Thermal Management. Um, we'll start with a short overview of the topics which we will discuss today. So, first, I'll show what kind of different uh, applications use high power LEDs. For this webinar, we will focus on the infrared LEDs and applications, as we can't discuss uh, all of the high power LED applications in, in half an hour. So regarding infrared applications, we will begin with a short overview about the infrared LEDs. So what are the main parameter, parameters and what uh, could be important for infrared applications? Then I briefly want to, uh, want to switch to our photo detector and photo uh, diodes uh, and the transistors, in which applications uh, to use a diode, in which applications to use the photo transistor. Um, we just learned from uh, from Ernst um, uh, that these yeah, that we can have very high current, uh, high power uh, drivers, um, and this means that also a lot of heat will be generated. Yeah? So the thermal management will become very important. So I'll explain you why and what we can do to keep the to keep the temperature under control. Then last but not least is uh, EMI. So we, we will look together to some filter topologies and some components which we can use uh, as a solution for EMI. And I'll, find, I'll finalize the presentation with the summary slides, and then we will have some time for questions and answers. So as mentioned, uh, I want to show you first an overview of which applications can use high power LEDs. So this goes from general lighting uh, to signalization to UV for curing and lito lithography, for example, or security. Um, we also have the different wavelengths uh, for horticulture in our portfolio. Um, we also have, for example, uh, a development kit uh, with LED drivers and, the, contro and, and uh, the controls to control each individual uh, wavelength. Um, then for infrared, um, if we think there for high, high power or high current applications, uh, we could think of uh, security cameras, uh, night vision or machine vision. Good. Um, what makes the best infrared LED and what are the main ingredients that we use in our kitchen to make the perfect LED? Of course, the first and the most important part is the dye or the chip, eh, which is also called the emitter. In our products, we use pre-selected dyes so that we have a good match of all the optoelectrical op opto parts. The second most important part is the housing and the contacts to which the electricity is flowing. Eh? Here we use in all our products uh, gold-plated contacts for better contacting, better, so better soldering, and better electricity flow. We use industry standard packages for every product, and we have a good fit for almost every application. Um, the last part is the encapsulation. So this is optimized for the emitted wavelength, and it can be used also to shape the light. In the next slides, we will go deeper uh, into the dye and into the encapsulation. So for infrared, uh, there are two standard wavelengths that we offer for our uh, infrared LEDs. Eh? This is 850 nanometers and 940 nanometers. Perhaps you wonder what's the, different be what's the difference between the centroid wavelength and the peak wavelength? Uh, well, it it is an important parameter for infrared LEDs eh? because the detector needs to be able to see the light from the emitter. Um, so the peak wavelength is, as the name suggests, is the main uh, emission wavelength uh, or the wavelength with the maximum um, with the maximum amount of uh, of energy. So this is what we see here. Um, and for the um, the centroid wavelength, there it, it's um, the left and the right part of this of this peak. Uh, they will contain the same amount of energy. It's not 100% symmetrically. So this is actually also what the detector, uh, what the detector will see. Um, so please be aware of, of the different specification when you're selecting your infrared LED that you are talking about the peak wavelength or about the centroid wavelength. Um, <clears throat> when we are talking about emitted energy in most of our infrared LEDs, we don't talk about the radiant power, which is the total amount of optical energy but about the radiant intensity, which is expressed in milliwatts per steradian. 
And this is how much optical energy I have in one three-dimensional angle. This is, of course, also very depending on the viewing angle of the LED. And what we, as with Electronic, offer uh, are radiant intensities for standard uh, infrared LEDs from 1 um, milliwatt per star radian up to 100 milliwatt per star radian. For high-power LEDs, um, we can reach radiant intensities of about 800 milliwatt per star radian. And this is actually with, with the nominal current. Um, it's also possible to drive the LEDs above their nominal, nominal current, either continuous or pulsed. But I'll get back to that later uh, in the presentation. Um, as you could see on the previous slide, there is a huge rate range in the radiant intensity, which is very depending on the viewing angle. So here you can see two different uh, emissions uh, or two different intensity distributions. Uh, in light blue, you can see a 30 degree beam angle, uh, which is actually, you, you go for the 50% the of the intensity. So it's two times full width half max. So it's uh, two times 15 degrees, meaning uh, 30, 30 degrees in total. Um, and we have uh, another example of um, a 100, uh, 140 degree uh, beam angle. Eh? And here you can see that a lot of more, a lot more of the energy is is uh, concentrated in the in the middle of the narrow beam solution in here in light blue, and so we have achieved this with the correct type of encapsulation and the correct form of our lens that is put on top of the chip. We offer viewing angles uh, from uh, from 20 degrees to 150 degrees. And the right encapsulation also means uh, a material which does not absorb any of the emitted light, eh, of the intended light. It could absorb, for example, a lot of wavelengths, as long as it does not absorb the emitted wavelength. That's very important. Um, next to shaping of the light and the efficiency, the encapsulation also um, acts as a, as, a pro as a mechanical protector for the chip. Uh, looking to applications, um, it really depends what kind of beam angle and radiant intensity you need. Uh, for example, if there is a short uh, range wide angle detection, the best solution could be a wide viewing angle, which we cover um, uh, with which we cover a lot uh, big angle and a large area with with one LED. Uh, let's say you have a long range application, um, which could be a camera, uh, well, the, and which is used outside. Then you will need a very small viewing angle so that we can bring the energy as much forward as possible. Uh, in that case, there is uh, no need for the light to go in a wide direction. Another important topic for some infrared applications is the switching frequency of the LED. When we switch on uh, any LED, it will take some time for the light output to reach a certain level. This is what we call the rise time and the, and the fall time. Um, so it, the fall time is when you switch off the LED from the from the high intensity to to a very low intensity. Um, so the rise time and the fall time these are the optical resp uh, response times. Uh, but why are they so important? Well, the shorter the rise time and the fall time are, the higher the switching frequency frequency can be. As standard infrared LEDs, they have a rise time and a fall time of about ten nanoseconds, uh, meaning that uh, one hundred megahertz is more or less the maximum for such kind of uh, application. Um, the rise time and the fall time are depending on the parasitic capacitance and the junction capacitance. In this graph, we can see that the rise time and the fall time are depending also on the, on the driving current. The higher the driving current, uh, the, uh, um, the lower the, the rise time and the fall time will be, so the higher uh, switching frequencies we can use. On the second graph here, you see, uh, for example, a pulse. Um, and here you have the TR, the rise time, and here the fall time. And we define it as worth electronic from 10% um, from to 90%. <clears throat> so uh, one could also measure the optical response uh, between 20 and 80%, which will result in a shorter rise time and a shorter fall time. But the curve will look or, or could look exactly the same. So. For infrared LEDs, when you are comparing uh, different solutions, please uh, take into account that not only the, the rise time, but also how the rise time and the fall time are defined. Because it can it can even uh, the different the difference can be even up to factor two. The switching time uh, is also linked to the pulse capability. Now, with pulse capability, we mean what kind of peak currents I can send through my LED. 
an LED has a maximum a maximum current for continuous use, but an LED also has a maximum peak current. Working with pulses through the infrared LEDs results in a high radiant intensity for a short period of time. This higher radiant intensity will be beneficial for the range and the signal, but there are some things to take into account when working with pulses through LEDs. Uh, a lot of heat will be generated for a short period of time, and this heat, um, yeah, it, it needs to get, get out of the chip. So you, you need some kind of a, a, a longer off time for, to, uh, for the LED to relax. Um, so here we have an example of, of a standard chip of uh, 0.05 square millimeter, which we pulse at 700 milliamp. And with a simple, uh, simple calculation, uh, this would mean a power density of one kilowatt in one uh, square centimeter. Now, let's say that, of course, 50% of the electrical power will be converted into optical power, but it's still 50% uh, of, the, of the electrical power, which will be converted in, into heat. Uh, we, with this example, I just want to point out that the power density can be huge eh, when, you, uh, when you're pulsing LEDs. So the maximum pulse current is, uh, is depending on the duty cycle, on the chip size, and on the package. Um, what you can see here is, uh, is a graph, is the, um, the relation of a certain LED between the current, pulse, the current, the pulse time, and the duty cycle. And the shorter the pulse uh, time is, the shorter the duty cycle uh, is, the, the higher the peak current uh, can be. In this example, uh, if you have, for example, a pulse of one microsecond, uh, and the, the, uh, the max current for continuous use is one amp, for example, um, with a duty cycle of 50%, you can drive the LED uh, up to 1.7 amp. But if, if you remain the same uh, pulse time, but you work with a duty cycle of, for example, 20%, the current goes up to about three amps. And you can see the same relation if you if you keep the duty cycle of twenty percent, but you increase um, or, you, or you decrease the uh, the pulse time, then the current can go up and up to five amp. So um, these were the most important parameters I uh, on the infrared LEDs I wanted to explain to you. So now let's. Let's shift to the detectors eh? because infrared light is invisible for the human eye. So you would need to you would need something to detect the infrared light, uh, as you can uh, as you can see here. Uh, so this can be achieved by using photodetectors. And photodetectors these are silicon uh, semiconductors which are driven in the reverse current. And there are two main types uh, of these detectors, being the photodiodes and the phototransistors. And each has its own advantages and disadvantages. And there are some small differences in the parameters and the way they are specified. Uh, when we look to the photodiode, uh, a, a very small current is generated by light. Uh, this has a linear output signal and it has a very short response time, eh, which means that they can work with very high switching frequencies. The phototransistors that eh, they generate and they amplify the electrical uh, current through light. Here, the current is milliamps while with the photo, uh, photodiode, it was uh, microamps. So we also have uh, a higher gain uh, when working with, um, with phototransistors. Um, good, here you see an overview of uh, our high power LEDs, as I mentioned in one of the, one of the first slides. So we have uh, solutions for uh, UV, infrared, horticulture or signalization and white uh, um, or general lighting applications. Um, so these are all, they all have the same structure, but they have a different chip. Um, for the infrared LEDs, we also now have uh, a new family with a QFM package, which has uh, radiant intensities up to 800 uh, milliwatt per steradian. Good, then I would like to switch uh, to the topic of thermal management, eh, which is also important, which is actually important for all high power LED applications, including uh, infrared. Let's first start with why uh, we would need thermal management in our LED application. There are two very important reasons, eh, being the lifetime and the performance. For the lifetime, we mainly mean the degradation uh, of the product, which you can see here in this graph. The light output would, will start to degrade over time, and in this case, it's, it's a case for all LEDs. But the higher the temperature, here we have the comparison between 45, 55, and 85 degrees, 
uh, the less lifetime uh, you will have. Of course, it also depends on what degradation is acceptable in your application, eh? how much and how much lifetime is required. If, for example, you want to maintain 90% uh, of the initial intensity, um, and then, for example, uh, and you want to have 20,000 hours, then the application would need to run at about 45, maximum 45 uh, degrees. Um, for white LEDs, uh, there is uh, LM80 data, which can be used uh, for lifetime prediction. Um, then the, the next point is the, uh, is the performance of the product. And this you can see here in this graph. So we specify um, the optical performance, or actually we specify almost all um, optoelectrical parameters at 25 degrees junction temperature. So here you see the relative uh, radiant flux uh, um, as a percentage. So 100% is at 25 degrees. But uh, if the junction temperature would be 80 degrees, uh, uh, sorry, it would be 110 degrees, then the, you would lose already 20% of the light. So, and let's say that the power that you put in the LED remains the same, then of course, the, if you get less uh, optical power out of it, out of the system, then the efficiency will, uh, will also drop. Another point, which depends a little bit on the application, uh, which could be critical, is the color shift. Uh, the bigger the temperature or the higher the temperature will be, the, yeah, the more the color will shift, um, but it depends, as I said, on the application, if it's a problem, um, yes or no. So um, now what could be the solution? Well, that's implementing a good thermal management. Eh? And as an LED supplier, we take care of the thermal resistance from the junction to the thermal pad, but it's also important to get the heat away from the thermal pad. Um, and yeah, with this slide, I just want to point out which LEDs or which kind of LED systems or applications uh, would need cooling. Well, uh, at the end, it, it really depends on uh, on these parameters. So we have the ambient, and I will get back to this from formula later on in the presentation, but it depends on the ambient. It depends on the thermal resistance of the total system, and it depends on the, on the, uh, on the power you put in the LED. For example, with low uh, with low power LEDs, uh, let's say below uh, 100 milliwatt, um, yeah, the thermal resistance can be very high, and still the junction temperature that you will reach will be um, yeah will be limited. Let's say uh, 50 degrees, um, which will result in um, in rather low junction temperature. So here, heat management is is not a problem, and the thermal resistance here is huge. So, and for example, if you have an indication LED on your PCB, which you control with 10 milliamps, that's a really low power, um, then the junction temperature will, will barely uh, rise, let's say. Um, but the thing is, is, you go from tens of milliwatts, but with power LEDs, you, you talk about several watts. Um, so with this much higher power, the thermal resistance becomes much more important. And if you don't take care of the, the thermal resistance of the, the entire system, then the junction temperature will be out, yeah, out of specification or will be too high, which will lead to a shorter lifetime and a drop in performance. So one solution can also which could also be to use many different low power LEDs, and this is how so this is this could be a very good solution for for some applications, uh, if you want to have a, a uniform light. Uh, but if you want to bundle the light with, with reflectors or with lenses, then it's much uh, better to do that if you can, uh, can start from a very small point source. Uh, and then you go back again to, to high power LEDs. <clears throat> Good. Um, so uh, let, let's take a look to the, uh, to the path the heat will take from junction to ambient. Eh? So here we have a basic, uh, a basic LED system. Here we zoomed in on the LED, and here we've zoomed in on the chip. So of course, the heat is being generated in the chip, uh, more specifically in the, in the quantum well, which you can see here between the, uh, the N and the P layer. Uh, then the heat has to be conducted, because that's the only way the heat can get out of the LED. It has to be conducted through the thermal pad uh, inside the LED, through the ceramic substrate of, uh, yeah, it's still, it's still the LED here. Um, and then, as so, th this is one thermal resistance from junction to the case of or to the thermal pad to the case of the LED. 
and then uh, once you once the heat is at the bottom of the LED, it there it the next step it sees is the thermal resistance of the PCB. Um, so you have you have a, a, a temperature gradient from uh, from the back from the backside of the LED to the backside of the PCB, um, and then there is the heatsink. But sometimes uh, there's also a thermal interface material between the PCB and the heatsink. I'll explain the thermal interface materials uh, in a couple of slides. Um, but yeah, the 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 thermal resistance should be low. But nevertheless, there is still a, a thermal resistance of the thermal pad. And then the last the last step is of course to get the heat uh, away, so to put it to the, to the ambient, and this is what the heatsink is doing uh, via radiation and convection. It's giving the heat away to the ambient. Um, yeah, here I just want to point out so um, the thermal resistance for these high power LEDs like these is often in the range of 10 Kelvin uh, Kelvin per watt. Then this uh, this formula I showed you already before. Um, so it's yeah, it's a calculation that you could use um, to to determine the junction temperature. So it's depending again on the ambient, the thermal resistance of the system, and also the power dissipation. And for power, uh, we mean the DC power we put in the LED. But uh, for LED sim systems, there could also be a big ripple current, and the AC component of the ripple current can also lead uh, is also a form of of power which can also uh, generate heat in the junction. But this is also something I'll explain in the next, uh, in, in the next slides. Um, yes, so it's, uh, as I mentioned, you know, if you, if you make, if you would increase the ambient temperature um, with 10 degrees, then automatically the junction temperature will also decrease, increase with 10 uh, degrees. So it's very important to take all of this uh, three uh, parameters into account when you are um, specifying your system. Eh? What should be the lifetime? What should be the performance? And it's important to know also what what will be the ambient temperature, and uh, yeah, the result of the calculation for the performance and lifetime will lead to a certain thermal resistance and a certain power that you need to put into the system. Good. Um, so I mentioned uh, the thermal interface materials uh, before. So why should one use a thermal interface material? Well, the surface of the heatsink it can be can be quite rough. So when you will mount the, uh, your PCB on the heatsink without the thermal interface material, then you will probably have some air gaps in between. Uh, air is unfortunately a very bad conductor. So the goal of the thermal interface material is to fill the air gaps between the two surfaces. In that way, uh, there is less thermal resistance from the PCB to the heatsink. There are several solutions for thermal interface materials, but at the end, they all make sure that there are less air gaps um, when the PCB is mounted on the heatsink. Um, a couple of parameters which are uh, which are very important for thermal interface materials. These are the uh, the thermal conductivity, and uh, this is the amount of thermal energy uh, the material can transfer from one contact surface to the other. So it's the ability to conduct the heat. It's independent of the material's thickness and the compression. Then the other key parameter is the thermal resistance. Yeah, the resistance uh, that, the, that the material can inflict on uh, heat traveling through the material material. So, and it also decreases with material compression. We as Wirt Electronic, we have standard uh, thermal pads in our portfolio. Yeah, these are soft and formable, and they are also self-adhesive. And the best uh, thermal performance will be obtained when with a compression of 10 to, uh, to 30 percent. Uh, often customers will need a customized solutions, um, and we offer that to, to all of our customers. So please get in contact with uh, the World Electronic Account Manager to support you on uh, customization of thermal pads. So um, after the, the thermal uh, interface material, uh, there is still the heatsink. Yeah? And the heat sinks we can split up into two main groups, eh, being the passive heat sinks and the active heat sinks. With passive heat sinks, there's an, a natural unforced airflow through the fins of the heat sink. Um, and with active heat sinks, how, um, they have an integrated fan which can uh, push or force air through the heat sink. And depending on the application uh, and mainly on the power, um, and uh, you would you would really need uh, an, an active system. Uh, for example, if you have systems of uh, of of 200 an LED spot of 200 watts, 
this is very difficult to do with with a with a passive heat sink <clears throat> sorry so the only only solution would be to do it with an, with an uh, with a fan um and for some applications you will have the choice eh, either to do it in a passive way or uh, with a passive heat sink or with an active uh, active heat sinks but there are also some a, a trade off that you have to make uh, a, a trade off that you have to do to make the decision if you go for the active or the passive heat sink and the advantage of an of an active cooling is that it can be much smaller and much smaller also means a bit more uh, less uh, less weight um but it will also be less efficient so because the fan needs to be powered so you have an additional component being the fan um the fan yeah will consume energy the fan is also a component that can fail over time um so the lifetime of the system will be uh will be reduced um and i think these are the most important so indeed reliability uh, size and weight and of course also a fan if you power it um there are some silent versions but nevertheless a rotating motor uh, could produce uh, some audible noise good then um the last to uh, topic of the webinar is emi mm -hmm. let's first take a look to the input filter um and here we see a, a pi filter with two electrolytic capacitors and one filter inductor so the electro electrolytic capacitor said they de de decouple the LED driver from the rest of the system and the relatively high ESR of the electrolytic capacitor, it also has a, a positive effect on the filter since um, it, it will have a better damping effect. Uh, um, and then the combination of this, uh, these two electrolytic capacitors with, uh, with this filter inductor will, yeah, will give you a very efficient, uh, efficient filter. Um, then we also have an, uh, yeah, a smaller, uh, it could be an MLCC capacitor here, and this one will give a very low impedance connection for the differential mode noise. Then, um, here we see, uh, we, I highlighted only the, the, the output capacitor in the next slides, we will go also to the, to the filter of the output. Um, but this, um. This will also reduce the the, the ripple, yeah? um, and if because if you because if you uh, here you uh, for example ripple current uh, you have a certain peak to peak value, so you have a changing uh, changing current, and if you have uh, if the LED would be very close to the LED driver, that could probably be done without the output capacitor, but in some applications you have an LED driver, and then you could have a wire running to the LED board, and it could be an LED string. With with a long with a trace from let uh, one to let two etc cetera, etc, cetera. and the combination uh, of the conductive emissions with yeah the antenna eh, or the LED string uh, the traces and the cables could lead to radiated emissions. So this output capacitor will help to reduce uh, the EMI. So do we need an output capacitor when the when the string is very short? Um, well, it could be it could be done. Uh, perhaps also without the output capacitor. But um, another important point to note with the output capacitor is here we've made the comparison eh, with um, we on the x-axis uh, time and here the, the LED current. So the average of this uh, red line is also 330 milliamps, uh, let's say. Uh, so both will give the same amount of light. But due to the AC component or the RMS value of this uh, this red curve, it will also generate more heat, and generating more heat will mean a higher junction temperature, and that will mean uh, a lower efficiency and a shorter lifetime. Um, so you could solve this. Eh? This is the difference here is quite drastically between the red line and the black line. But uh, the bigger the output capacitor is, the less uh, ripple you will have. It's not visible, so for the human eye, it will not be uh, dis uh, perceived as uh, disturbing. Um, but uh, this output capacitor leads to uh, less heat, and also, as I mentioned before, also to um, uh, to lower EMI. Um, so the so now we take a look to the output uh, filter, where we have again a pi filter. Uh, with here as an output capacitor, we have, for example, used a polymer capacitor uh, because they don't have the piezoelectric effect uh, with high ripple currents uh, that uh, MLCCs do have. 
Uh, then we have uh, two Chibit ferrites, L2 and L3. So these will be used uh, to filter, filter out the differential mode noise. And here again, we have uh, an MLCC, for example, with, um, uh, with low, low, which will create a low impedance connection for the high frequency differential mode noise. To solve common mode issues, uh, we have here an, uh, uh, added a common mode choke. And this is really there where you have a longer cable, longer traces. Um, yeah, you could pick up or radiate a lot of noise. And the combination of, the, of this filter will solve the common mode noise and differential mode noise. And from the other point, the, uh, the capacitors here will also reduce the ripple, which will result in the lower um, junction temperature. Good, uh, last slide. Um, I just want to point out the most important things we have addressed in this uh, in this presentation. So for the infrared LED said, they're often, uh, the main wavelengths are 850 nanometers, 940 man, uh, nanometers. The range in intensities is huge. Uh, same for the beam angles, there are solutions from 20 degrees to 150 degrees. Um, if you're doing some kind of uh, communication, eh, um, then please take care of the rise time and the fall time uh, because they will determine also the maximum switching frequency. And where, when you're pulsing uh, infrared LEDs, um, you should also check the on time and the duty cycle to make sure that you, uh, that you don't damage the LED or that the lifetime will not be reduced. Um, for systems with, with communication, you, can have, you, you should also use um, photo detectors. And that can be either a diode, a photodiode, or a phototransistor. Thermal management, because that is important for the lifetime and the performance of the LED system. Um, the higher the power is, the more important the thermal resistance uh, from junction to ambient will be. And one way to improve the thermal resistance from the PCB to the to the heatsink yeah, will be using thermal interface materials. And in the, the last slides, uh, we discussed the input and the output filter to uh, yeah to improve uh, EMI behavior, and mainly there where you have some cables from LED driver to the LED string, um, this yeah this could really be needed to, to integrate in your system. Good, that was uh, that was my presentation. Thanks a lot for your attention. Um, and then I think it's back to Alex. See if there are some questions. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Rolf. Very interesting story. Uh, same goes for Ernest, of course, from the presentation from where we started with. Uh, very interesting. Um, I have a few questions coming in, but before I do that, I want to remind everyone that we have an other uh, another webinar planned in two weeks. I mentioned this before, uh, uh, February 11th. Uh, please sign in if you haven't done so. Um, I will try to give you the questions from your presentation first, Rof. Uh, it will make the management a little bit easier. Um, mm -hmm. You are, uh, let me see, what is the reason to select a 940 nanometer over an 840 nanometer uh, infrared diode? Um, well, let me go back to this one. Eh? Yeah, because the the, the visible uh, one re there's could be a couple of reasons there. So one reason could be that um, you have the visible spectrum which starts at about four hundred something nanometers, um, and here of course we, we the human eye can't see eight hundred fifty nanometers, um, but you can see it's not a super mo monochrome uh, emitter. Yeah? There is also some energy at seven hundred up to seven hundred fifty nanometers, yeah? and that. Uh, perhaps could still be um, be visible. So uh, with 940 nanometers, you see that it's really that there's no energy anymore at uh, 850 nanometers. So there's a bit, there's still a difference. So that could be one reason. And it, uh, you, um, the I believe that 850 nanometer LEDs they're also more um, yeah more efficient. You get more radiant power uh, or radiant intensity um, than compared to the 940 nanometers. I think it could also depend on what kind of detector you're using. If you're working with cameras or with uh, photodiodes, um, yeah, that could also influence why the 850 nanometer or the 940 nanometer would be the best uh, best choice. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, then there's another question. It's about the 
thermal fill material you mentioned about. Uh, someone's asking if that has also some isolation properties. Um, yes, it's uh, it could have. Um, I also can also quickly try to check this. Uh, oops. I'll I will share also the um, I'll show you that via here share. Oh, oops. Wrong button. Let me quickly check it or verify it. So you have the um, shielding, the thermal pads. You, you can see the screen, right, on the on the website, yeah. Alex. Yes, we can. Yes, perfect. So there we have. So this is uh, yeah the the product group of the uh, thermal gap fillers, and there I think we have a specification. Um, also on the yes the, on the the electric strength there, which is uh, eight kilovolt per uh, per millimeter. Um, so this this version has um, so this thermal interface material, this thermal pad has also a, a, um, an isolation uh, or the electrical the electric strength. But okay. there are many other solutions that you can that you can use for uh, as a thermal interface material, of course. And not all of them have have elect, uh, have also a dielectric strength or an isolation. Uh, Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Uh, then I had a question from from for Ernest. I'm not sure if he's still here. I will oh. stop, sh stop I sharing. Am, I'm here. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. You talked about a bug boost where the situation was that V in was almost the same as V out, and then you said that something something uh, fuzzy could happen there. Uh, someone is asking here what what could happen there. What is the <laughs> problem in this area? <laughs> What can happen? Anything can happen. Uh, no, yeah, the, 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 really anything can happen. The point really is that um, uh, uh, you, you're looking at a converter that that does uh, that does operate generally different in that particular region. So it's 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 uh, it's uh, imperative that if you do want to do things like dimming or or any other type of uh, realistic function for for that region that you need to double check and the testing uh, testing it. So I, I just showed those slides to show that the analog dimming. Uh, works well there. You can also uh, have a look at the PWM dimming, etc. But uh, what would happen is uh, potentially with the LED drivers, it's, it's instability, right? So it it a lot a lot of over and undershoot on the on the LED current if the thing doesn't behave well. Obviously, we I show that because we think our parts work well. So, but uh, you know, my point is really check it because it's not just a part; it's the whole circuit around it, the layout, etc. That can make it unstable. It's just a different region that you need to double check. <laughs> okay, perfect. Sorry. I thought there was also another question I don't don't from 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 Gert van Nuremberg. Uh, maybe I missed it in the general chat. Oh, okay, so maybe he sent it to me only, I don't know. Okay, so I will uh, drop him a message and I'll... Well, if you can repeat it and then if, uh, if it's not too personal then we could share it. Yeah, I think he was asking something about LED flickering. Is Gert still there? Question coming in from Marco. Let's maybe refer to this one. Uh, what driver output voltages do you typically see chosen? Just wondering what the practical economic trade offs are. Is that a question for me? Yes, it is. Can you, sorry, repeat it in the beginning? What, uh... what driver output voltages do you typically see chosen? Just wondering what what is the practical economic trade off? Oh, for the amount of LEDs in series. Oh, that's 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 very very dependent. Um, there is this high limit of uh, what is it, sixty volts or so, where everything beyond that becomes. Uh, so I don't see that a lot. So it, it typically stops at well, forty five. But generally, mostly I see something like twenty eight, thirty volts, something like that. It really, in the end, also it depends on on what rail you have available, right? If you have if you have five volts and you want to do fifty, that's just not a good deal. And your, your ratio becomes crappy. You need to do all kinds of funky stuff. Um, but um, yeah, in, in 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 things where you run from twelve volts, like automotive, typically it's twenty to thirty volts. You see, but um, it it goes all over the place. I think that was also part of 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 what I wanted to say is that you know DC DC converter, which is the origin of uh, of, of LED drivers. Yeah, they are sort of well behaved, and 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 everybody more or less does the same. It's it's not so not so not so diverse with LED drivers. 
it's different. Everybody does something else. One wants to do color, the other wants to do extremely low dimming ratio, the, the third one wants to do extremely high current. You know, there's weird people out there doing weird stuff. So. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that summarizes all the questions, unless I missed something, but I don't think so. If we did miss one, please drop us an email. Um, I will see if I can make myself presenter again, and I will share my presentation. Uh, it works. It is. You can always, oh, I didn't put it, you always write one of those those two guys an email if you have any questions uh, regarding either of them, uh, of their presentations. Uh, for now, I just want to end this session. I want to thank you for uh, participating, spending your time with us, uh, and hopefully see you next time, uh, uh, well, maybe in two weeks already. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye.